Right. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Nicholas Lambert, and I teach uh, the course that is in conjunction with the Artist Now lecture series. So, uh, first and foremost, uh, welcome to everyone from the public and from the university who's attending uh, tonight's lecture. And uh, more than anything, I want to uh, welcome you uh, to future talks. Uh, one of the best things about this program is that it's free and open to the public. And the public, every time we have an Artist Now lecture series, it would be wonderful to see people from the community, uh, people from other universities. I noticed already some Mayan instructors and Mayan students. That is great. That's wonderful. There will always be seats uh, open for you to come and attend these talks. So, if you want to learn more about the Artist Now Lecture Series, learn about upcoming uh, talks, uh, presentations, just look at the uh, UWF Peck School of the Arts website for Artist Now, or just search Artist Now Peck School of the Arts. Uh, you'll find a PDF of the whole schedule. We do have some printed uh, schedules floating around, but the best way to find it is online. Uh, so come back next week if you'd like. Uh, we have a visiting speaker uh, next Wednesday. Uh, September 26th, uh, Orrin, uh, Orrin Katz is presenting, and this sounds like it's a Nathaniel Stern guest, if I had to guess. Uh, this lecture discusses the work of the tissue culture and art project, as well as other uses of biological technologies and logic for art, design, and architecture. Uh, so please, come back next week. Uh, and see the next visiting artist. We had a great talk last week. Uh, tonight there's a lot of excitement for Hank's talk tonight. I, I know he presented earlier today uh, in Josie's class and students were raving. Uh, Josie and I and Shalene Green had the pleasure of having lunch with Hank, learned that we went to the same graduate school and so forth. And these folks then saw the music that went to the Haggerty and saw the incredible show that Lynn Schuma helped. Uh, uh, curate and the museum, if I'm not mistaken. So, so at any rate, uh, in a second, I'm going to turn over to Josie, who will introduce tonight's guest. A uh, couple things. Uh, please try to uh, make sure your cell phone's turned off so it doesn't interrupt others. Uh, let's also have a vibrant uh, question and answer series where we ask the artists, you know, share your insights, share your questions. We can take that as long as you want. There's also signs all over this place that say, no food or drink. Uh, this is something that Randy has really specified and really wants people to follow. So in the future, or hopefully now, there shouldn't be any food or drink unless you happen to be up here. We get food and drink. We get to drink this water, but not you. <laughs> <laughs> so, the reason being, right, just because we get tired of here. This is, this is intense speaking in front of these many people. We need to hydrate. But uh, the brand new uh, ACL lecture hall cannot supposedly have food and water. I suggest that we just put a drain right at the bottom. And all the water drains out and just goes down there. But we can't, so please follow that rule. Uh, other than that, that's it. Um, for me, tonight's a special night because almost every semester, well, not almost, every semester in my class, I show Hank Willis Thomas's work. Uh, so if he wasn't our guest, at some point in the semester I'd be presenting a handful of images, but what's better than having Hank show his work and talk about it? I also, almost every semester, uh, assign writings by Deborah Willis. Many of you on the audience, those in the arts and museums, know that Deborah Willis is hands down probably the most important uh, art historian who looks at African American photography, and one of the great, great intellectuals and writers of our time. She also happens to be Hank's mom. So uh, there's a very talented family, to say the least. So Josie Osborne will introduce our guest tonight. Thank you. Hey, everybody. So we're so happy to have Hank here to share his work with you tonight. Um, and happy to see lots of new faces, as Nicholas mentioned. Um, Hank Willis Thomas has really been an emerging and powerful voice in the visual discourse around race, class, gender, and power, and history, particularly American history. And I know many, there are many instructors here tonight who use his work in their teaching, and many students who have been very excited about it as well. Um, Hank received his BFA from 
uh, the New York University's Tisch School of the Arts, and his MFA in Photography, along with an MA in Visual Criticism from California College of, the Art, of Arts in San Francisco. And his work's been published in a monograph called Pitch, Black, Pitch Blackness uh, by Aperture in 2008. His work is also in numerous public collections, including the Whitney Museum, the uh, Museum of Modern Art in New York, and the Brooklyn Museum. And he's uh, participated in and been a part of uh, numerous collaborative projects uh, that have also been featured at Sundance Film Festival and installed publicly at the Oakland International Airport and the Oakland Museum of Art in California. So this past year he did a residency in Paris and he's currently uh, preparing for a show at the Jack Shaman Gallery in New York, where uh, the gallery that represents him. We are very grateful to Fo Wilson, who initiated this invitation um, a couple of years ago. And um, unfortunately, Fo is no longer here at UWM, but and was not able to make it here tonight. But we're really grateful that she got this going. So please join me in welcoming Hank Willis Thomas. Hi, everyone. Hello. Uh, so uh, I'm slow to get going. Uh, first, I want to know, and maybe I should turn the light up, um, on me. <laughs> um, how, um, how many people were here this morning? All right. So the few of you that are here this morning act like you didn't hear some of what you heard. I, I talked to uh, mostly uh, undergraduate students this morning, and I talked about my work starting in high school and then going up to around 2006 or seven. And tonight I'll probably start go back around 10 years and hopefully get up pretty current. But um, I tend to, uh, whenever I do a talk, I tend to do, the, do them pretty frequently. And I like to do stuff that I um, haven't done before. Uh, so I figured I'd try that now. <laughs> uh, there's a, a piece I'm working on for my show at Jack Shane Gallery. Does anybody get seizures from here? Okay, close your eyes. I'm serious. Because <laughs> um, there's a piece I'm, I'm working on. And, um, and I just want to like show it to you guys before I even figure out what it is and what's happening with it. So, uh, you know, bear with me. Um, I always use my mouse when I do this. All right, I'm gonna turn this light down. I come here tonight and plead with you. <clears throat> believe in yourself and believe that you're somebody. I said to the group last night, nobody else can do this for us. No document can do this for us. No Lincolnian Emancipation Proclamation can do this for us. No Kennesonian or Johnsonian Civil Rights Bill can do this for us. If the Negro is to be free, he must move down into the inner resources of his own soul and sign with a pen and ink of self-assertive manhood his own emancipation proclamation.
This is a piece I'm calling Black Righteous Space right now, um, and it's a voice-activated thing. Uh, so, like, somebody say something loud. So basically what happens is like it's obviously the rebel flag, but I've, I've changed the colors to red, black, and green. When there's no noise, and then when there's noise, this happens. And I'm really interested in kind of seeing what happens when voice activates a, a, a visual sign that we kind of have uh, an applied historical meaning to that's been altered, etc. But I had never seen a projector and figured there's a projector here. So. <laughs> So, and I always think it's a good idea to start your talk um, right after Martin Luther King. Um, <laughs> so, um, when I normally start to give a talk, I have to start with a quote um, called uh, from a book called Everything But the Burden, edited by Greg Tate. And uh, in the, there was an essay in it called Eminem, the White Negro by Carl Hancock Rux. And in the, in the essay he writes, there's something called Black in America, and there's something called White in America, and I know them when I see them, but I will forever be unable to explain the meaning of them because they're not real, even though they have a very real place in my daily way of seeing, a fundamental relationship to my ever-evolving understanding of history, and a critical place in my relationship to humanity. Um, and I often say if I could ever plagiarize an artist statement, this would be it, because it says so much about the complexities within the way I kind of have a relationship to race and, and identity in, in the United States especially as I continue to travel around the world and get to see other artists and see, meet people from other communities and understand different understandings of blackness, whiteness, um, in different cultural contexts. Uh, my book, uh, which Josie mentioned, is called Pitch Blackness, was published in 2008 by Aperture. Um, and when I titled it, the, to me the title, Pitch Blackness had three meanings for it. One, uh, pitch blackness because of a feeling of loss I felt after a, a family tragedy that I'll talk about a little bit later. Then pitch blackness because advertising, which is a theme in a lot of my work, uh, blackness is often pitched as a way to cash in on ideas about cool. Um, and then also, um, you know, uh, I realized one day when I was seven that, I, although, that my skin is actually not black, it's brown. And that I've actually never met a white person and, and so it just occurred to me that uh, pitch blackness, off whiteness, coffee is the color of my skin. Because, in, you know, we live in this culture where we, especially in the United States, speak about ident identity in this binary of blackness and whiteness where not, none of us actually fit into, or, or physically, or you might say morally described by those terms. Yet, uh, it's still also the majority of people in the world are not black or white, they're Asian. So it kind of is this kind of alternate reality where we kind of speak about things in this binary. You guys want to come down? Yeah. Come on down. <laughs> you got to run like a uh, price is right. <laughs> Woo! Come on down. <laughs> come on, come on. I'm just getting warmed up. Um, so and on that note, um, thinking about this, I, I started looking at uh, advertising, you know, very frequently in my work and kind of try to understand kind of what this ad means, what's for sale, and uh, or looking at other ads, like just another American Apparel ad, um, and trying to understand the, what this is, what this means. But I also look at historical images uh, like this. Does anybody know who Bert this Williams. is? Were you here earlier? <laughs> uh, so does anybody know who Burt Williams is? One of the greatest African-American vaudevillian singers, recording artists, and actors of the early 20th century. That's much better put than I would have put. <laughs> I would have just done this. Because what I found so fascinating about this image of Burt Williams is how most people have no idea who he is, uh, especially when they see him as he liked to present himself. And, and I find that so fascinating how he liked to present himself in the real world backstage and how he was celebrated as a performer in the mainstream society and kind of how his performance of, of blackness was in, in this kind of minstrel, vaudevillian uh, caricature way was kind of what society was embracing. And I'm really interested in kind of how we have these kind of dualities and these complexities and ways of, of understanding race, identity, gender, um, and, and, and thinking about kind of the status quo, okay, who's, who are these two people? 
Mike Tyson, Ronald Reagan. I have to ask how many people were alive when Ronald Reagan was president? Less than half the room. Um, and so, and so, when I was growing up, the status quo was, you know, there was this thing about the great white hope, and the status quo was always going to be a black uh, heavyweight athlete who was dominating the, the ring um, of, with physical prowess, but also there was this accepted that this white male would always be in control of everything else, pretty much. And what's what I found interesting in the past uh, few years is this interesting flipping of the script that happened, uh, where we have like uh, now we have the, the Klitschko brothers, who uh, these Ukrainian boxers who dominated the heavyweight uh, boxing ring for almost ten years now, and of course we know about the, kind of the great black hope that's come, um, and, and really interesting kind of how. This flipping of the scripts, kind of, although gender has not been broached, there's really interesting ways in which uh, future generations will have different understandings of kind of what's possible and who controls what um, based off of these representations. But also, I find it interesting that virtually no one cares about heavyweight boxing anymore. Um, <laughs> and I think because it kind of complex, it, you know, it brings this complexity to it. And I think because you know, it's not no surprise that they're Eastern European because. Eastern Europeans are often seen as the blacks of Europe, you know, and, and because they tend to live in the poor countries, they have to fight harder in different ways for success. And I believe that you tend to try hard, you tend to succeed more in places where you try harder. And so it really challenges this myth about kind of black male identity and physical prowess. Um, but also my work is heavily influenced by the work of my mother, who came across this book, The Sweet Fly Paper of Life by uh, Roy Dekarab and Langston Hughes. Um, in the 1950s, where she was a little girl at the Philadelphia Public Library, and she saw this book, and it was the first book where she saw images of African Americans um, depicted in ways that were similar to the way she saw them in the real world, in contrast to the mainstream society and media images of blacks, which were almost always of caricatures of, of servants, and um, and and looked at in kind of socially uh, deprived ways. Bless you. Uh, but also, so growing up, uh, my mother, you know, that led her to, to, to start a career as in photography. I grew up kind of with her along the way and all the things that she was doing. Um, and I recently was looking through kind of her old stuff and found this uh, research paper that she'd written, a uh, proposal for independent study that she'd written in 1973, where she says, I found no standard art history that refers to Afro-American artists. References have led me to more references, which are scanty. I've written 50 letters to possible resources and have enthusiastic feedback, but uh, by feedback by receiving letters, extending invitations to visit special collections at the libraries. The photographers I plan to concentrate on uh, research on are the following. And she lists about uh, 10 or 12 uh, African-American photographers. And why this was really important is because when she was studying photography in the early 70s, no one really had when she asked, well, were there, you know, were there any black photographers? And her professors could at the best name uh, Roy DeGarabba and Gordon Parks. And she was, kind of, and they were both, those, they were both living photographers at the time. And she uh, really wanted to take upon herself to do this research. And it led to 13 years later being her first book, uh, Black Photographers, 1840 to 1940, a biobibliography, which, and she's published since like almost 30 different books looking at representations of. African Americans in photography. And I find it fascinating though that someone who's a junior in, in college can really start a project that actually helps create a history because we all know history is created. It's only, you know, and if we don't tell our history, it won't be history. And I find, and, and that's fascinating to have grown up with someone kind of doing that. Uh, our work often intersects. I, 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 you know, I look a lot more like my mother than my father. Uh, and thank God. And then, uh, but uh, we do these projects, and, and, and one of the projects we've done is a show called Progeny, and this is a piece in it, um, and it's called Sometimes I See Myself in You, and it's really about kind of this duality of kind of being my own person, but also having a career that's very closely associated with someone else who's got a much longer career with uh, different kinds of experiences and approaches things from a different way. Um, my work is also very much influenced by my relationship with my cousin Sunday Willis, and this diptych describes our relationship, where like I was up at two o'clock in the morning taking pictures of us with my old polar camera, and he was so cool that he'd fall asleep with his sunglasses on. <laughs> um, I took this picture of him probably like the, in the fall, in the fall of 1999, and 
was soon after I graduated grad school, and it was, um, I thought, just a really beautiful portrait. And I, was, I loved the muted colors um, in that photograph. Uh, but I didn't know at the time that that would be the last photograph I took of him alive. Um, and that this would be the first photograph of, that I ever had printed in a newspaper. Um, and it was for, and it's because my cousin was murdered. It's, and reading the newspaper, uh, this article where my cousin had been in Philadelphia visiting uh, our grandmother and went out with some old friends from junior high school. Those guys were robbed and, uh, for their gold and platinum chains. And uh, they ran away and leave my cousin alone and he was shot in the back of the head. Um, and a um, really devastating experience for me because we lived together at the time, we lived together several years, and we were closest friends. Uh, but also reading, uh, so when he died, they asked for a photograph naturally for me, and I, I sent them this photograph. And when I read the newspaper article, I was really stunned by the, because the newspaper, I, you know, I, I knew the news was not objective, but you kind of have to believe the news is objective for you to really appreciate it. Um, but then reading kind of the headline, you know, a good guy slain for a few bucks. Um, killer shot him even though he didn't resist. Um, a lot of the, the, the kind of implications of that language, you know, why, you know, why was it necessary to say a good guy, you know? Uh, as, as it, so basically if he was a quote unquote bad guy and slain for a lot of bucks, maybe it wouldn't be news. You know, as, and, and then kind of, if he had, you know, killer shot him even though he didn't resist. So if he had resisted, maybe he had to come in, these weird things. But also reading the, the, the kind of sound bites of the article, kind of trying to kind of, basically what I felt like, kind of plead the case for the value of his life, you know, and how it distinguished it from the lives of perhaps our other associations of other young black men, uh, you know, to, to make him seem exceptional, which in my view, perhaps he was, but I'm not, I, I don't, I really have struggled with kind of this idea of kind of, you know, young black men are murdered uh, at an incredible rates in our country, and kind of the associations that people bring to to who they are and define who they are, and value evaluate their lives based off these uh, cultural stereotypes. I've always struggled with. Um, and at his funeral, I felt as the family photographer, I had to document it as photographers do, and it was a challenge because I realized that no picture I would take would actually um, express. The, the complexity of feelings that I was having, and also, more importantly, bring my cousin back. So it felt really futile. Um, while I was, and so this is, um, and so soon after this, I actually wound up going to graduate school. And uh, I went to graduate school with, uh, with one implication of what I wanted to focus on, and came, started graduate school with this kind of real heavy personal burden. Of, like, I felt like if I'm gonna make art, it has to mean something. And I happened to be reading a book uh, called Michael Jordan in the New Trans Global Economy. And it talked about how Nike went from being a $10 million company when uh, Michael Jordan signed on in 1984 to a $10 billion company when he retired in 2003. And all the ways of different markets from soft, soft drinks to cable news to uh, other clothing lines had really brand, you know, grown to be huge trans uh, national companies, you know, partly through the marketing of him as this transnational, transracial figure. Um, and one of the quotes that stuck out for me in this book was by Stanley Crouch, uh, where he says, uh, in 1960, if white girls in the suburbs had posters of a Negro that dark on the wall, there would have been hell to pay. That kind of racial paranoia is not true in the country now. Today, you have girls who are Michael Jordan fanatics and their parents don't care. Um, that was really heavy because thinking about he was born in 1963, and thinking about how basically in the first 25 years of his life, he went from being, you know, a, a black boy in the segregated South to being this international figure who was beyond categor categorization, almost deified. And I wanted to think about how someone of his stature uh, or his body type might have been looked at in a different period of time. And so I actually took that quote more literally and created this piece, which was uh, called Hang Time, circa 1923. And I started really thinking about how logos carry this meaning because we're, we're so inundated with logos every day that we kind of consume them and read them and process them before we even know we saw them. Um, and really interesting kind of how uh, I could perhaps embed my own two cents in, in to these logos, these hieroglyphs. Uh, so I created images like this, the fabric of our lives, talking about the cotton trade, um, 
this one, uh, the original Slam Dunk thing about him as a, a, a potential slave jumping off of the ship before uh, making it to the new, the new land. Uh, but also, I was thinking about advertising is the most ubiquitous language in the world, and it's always speaking one way. And I don't see why there aren't more people actually using this language, which you can go to China, you can go to India, you can go to Iraq, you can go to Cuba and Tibet, and you know, and people still can translate these the meanings in them. And I and I felt like that was something I really wanted to explore. So this is one of the pieces I created. It was called Absolute Power, and thinking about kind of how it, the creation of blackness, you know, in the cultural context of uh, I, I think I talk about uh, race as being the most successful advertising campaign of all time because in order to enslave human beings, you know, um, in the way that, that they, they did, you had to actually convince yourself and people that they weren't actually re real people. And to take, I think when I think about Africa, where I've only been to four countries in Africa, but I've been to, you know, I know a lot of people. And even just the four countries I've been to, I realize there's so much diversity. And thinking about 500 years ago, where there was, you know, there are still, but thousands of different languages being spoken, thousands of different cultures, different worldviews, um, on this huge continent with huge swaths of land. And what, what happens when you take people from such diverse um, communities and package them into ships and send them halfway across the world and tell them they're all the same? You know, um, and when you have 500 years later, their descendants are still trying to figure out essentially who they are. Uh, that's what I call kind of absolute power. You know, this idea of a monolithic black identity that we've kind of been forced, especially in the United States, to conform to um, these ideas that we actually didn't even create. I like to say the craziest thing about blackness is that black people had nothing to do with creating it. Um, and and so also thinking about how. Uh, slaves were branded as a, a sign of ownership, but also how today uh, so many of us live in an uh, age of branded consciousness where the way we validate and evaluate ourselves is very much often about either like the computer we use, the brand, the, the car we drive, um, uh, you know, there's so much, in the, or the clothes we wear, there's so much social conditioning and symbols that we send about ourselves through the products that we uh, imbibe and, 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 and support. Um, but I was also thinking about how, especially with young African American men, so many of the ideas about um, how to uh, ascend um, it are chained to ascending through sports and entertainment. You know, and uh, and so I, I was making this work called, and I called it the series branded. And, and these are this image, and this image are kind of more updated images where I'm really also also talking about the society of the spectacle and thinking about how black bodies um, were lynched and kind of looking at how bodies were, were kind of used in spectacle in the 30s and 40s, black bodies, and, and thinking about kind of the, the, the cultural and, and often uh, ancestral connection between contemporary athletes and, and some of these people who were uh, victims of, of uh, lynching. Um, but also um, thinking about the, the sharecropper and thinking about the NCAA, uh, where you have, you know, basically the set, especially in football, you have like seventy percent of the, the the players are the descendants of slaves who are working for free on fields, you know that their ancestors actually, you know, till and and and, and, it's, and and the fact that so much of it is about merchandising. There's so many things that I find curious to explore within that and try to represent that in my work. Uh, but I also started thinking about. Um, uh, credit cards as a form of indentured ser servitude. So my friend Ryan and I made. Uh, that you ever thought about the Mastercard? You know, who's the master? You know, um, and then also think maybe made the Afri Afro American Express uh, and the Discover Card. Uh, but really, and also explored other ways of, of contemplating. This is a piece called Absolute No Return, um, and then this is a piece just called Absolute because. Uh, Death is absolute, um, and then I, um, I, I I revisited that image from my cousin's funeral, and um, using the language of Mastercard priceless campaign, uh, and I felt like by using text with image and you know, design in a way that speaks to 
kind of the advertising culture, I might be able to do things that my work couldn't do in the, in the in the other context. And I was able to exhibit it outside in a few different places at the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts and at the uh, Birmingham Museum of Art. And there wasn't much controversy, ironically, until I got to Birmingham. And I like to show this video. <laughs> Proud to be the most watched local newscasts in Alabama. Fox 6 News, the most powerful name in local news. Fox 6 News reporter Melanie Posey takes a look at us. She joins us live from the museum tonight. Melanie? Well, Jenna and Devin, here is the picture that we're talking about. You can see the MasterCard logo and you see the MasterCard slogan, so you think it's a MasterCard ad, right? Wrong. What it is doing is creating a lot of dialogue those here at the museum say that is exactly what it was designed to do. The picture hangs boldly on the back of the Birmingham Museum of Art, an African-American family grieving at a funeral. The caption, a spin-off of the MasterCard advertising campaign. Three-piece suit, $250. Gold chain, $400. Nine-millimeter pistol, $79. Bullet, $0.60. Cent. Picking the perfect casket for your son, priceless. To the unknowing eye, it brings a strong response. It's not offensive to me too because it seems like it's stereotypical that no, that people are just tagging the black community with the things that we use, the things that we buy, the things that we want. And, um, I'm not black, but I would think that it would be offensive to black people. I think when someone walks off the street, they're wondering, is it an ad? If not, why is it up here? What is it? What's the point? Why is MasterCard have their name on it? Don't this is not an ad. It's contemporary art on display at the Birmingham Museum of Art. The artist, a young black man by the name of Hank Willis Thomas, the picture taken at his own cousin's funeral after he was killed during a robbery. He wanted to get at the grief his family was feeling and the frustration with this sort of cycle of, of violence that's sort of afflicting the country. I think he's using the term priceless here, not in a satiric way, but to suggest that life is the most priceless thing of all. Willis relies on artistic license to play off of the MasterCard logo, the key he uses knowing how much Americans connect with advertising. After learning what it's all about, Jennifer Swenson's response turned from offense to grief and eventually hope. I guess the artist had a choice. He could have picked up a gun and he could have sought revenge. And what this artist chose to do was to um, make a statement, even though it's offensive to some people, if it changed one person's thought process in life, then it would be worth it. Now, because of the response to this picture, the museum has put up this explanation. However, as you can see, it is rather small in comparison to the pictures of people who may miss it. So they plan to add a few. Also, the curator says the reason this piece is outside is because it was too large to fit inside the <laughs> so, I mean, that just says it all, doesn't it? Uh, I mean, it's really interesting when you make work that's political in nature, you actually show it in the public sense, you actually, you know, you, you want a response, and frequently, actually, you just don't get a response, and that's the response. But, you know, it was kind of my worst fear in finding out that members of the African American community were offended by the work I was making, and so I had to, like, write an op-ed for the Birmingham newspaper. But in watching this, you know, there's so many things that come out of it, you know, where you see, like, um, how people are, you know, how especially, like, this African woman, American woman is like, okay, they're, you know, it feels like it's stereotypical, it's just, you know, tagging up the things that we flaunt, we buy, like, guns and gold chains and three-piece suits, and, you know, the other one was like, I'm not black, you know, <laughs> in case you couldn't tell, but <laughs> I can see how it would be offensive to black people, you know, and so, like, it speaks about, like, who has the right to be offended by what and to talk about what, because it says, you know, it's not an ad, you know, it's art, so it's supposed to be provocative, you know, and it's uh, made by a young black man, so it's not racist, and, you know, it's a um, picture taken at his own cousin's funeral, so it's not insensitive, you know, all of these qualifiers that make it okay for me to make this work in this context. Um, and then, of course, there's this amazing kind of moment of clarity at the end when the woman says, you know, the artist had a choice, he could have picked up a gun and killed someone, or make art. <laughs> I think that made the right choice. <laughs> you know, there's this really amazing simplicity in the way that we try to, we have these discourses, especially in the public. And, and um, I actually, I'm going to show you a different piece that I, I, I um, 
<laughs> wasn't planning on showing, but it, it speaks to um, this relationship. Um, <coughs> interesting process of kind of like playing as men the way we did with boys and telling a story that was, you know, at least from our understanding true, uh, that had a real personal effect. And I was really trying to figure out how do you tell a story that everyone's heard before a thousand times in a new way. 
Um, and I thought by using G.I. Joe action figures in, in stop motion animation, it was kind of a disarming kind of new way to talk about it because in child's play, death is insignificant, whereas we know in reality um, it happens every day. And thinking about how boys, especially in the United States, are socialized to, to actually train to create these scenarios based around violence before they can even read, yet we find violence to be contemptible. Um, and speaking about that, I, around the same time I was making that piece, I was in New York and I saw like a group of teenagers, they were standing by um, this billboard and it was a, a group of like multi, you know, ethnic New Yorkers and I, and I, there's a couple young black men in there and I was wondering kind of how seeing images like this kind of affect the way that they kind of maneuver within their social group. Um, and I, I was looking at it and I saw, found something really fascinating. How many people, what's this an ad for? For what? How do you know? Because what? The logo. the logo. So we can see a logo in three letters and actually immediately translate to see uh, a, 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 it's Reebok. But what's it an ad for? Birth control? Birth control. Maybe. Because I found it fascinating, there's actually no Reebok product in this ad. You know, there's actually, it's 50 Cent, he's wearing a G-Unit tank top with the logo on it. So, in a way, so, it's so, so what's really for sale is this idea of him as a commodity. I am who I am. And I guess, of all the things he could have listed for him to be, you know, he really, at the end of the day, is just a criminal. Um, at least how he saw himself then. And I found it fascinating that, you know, they, I was like, okay, maybe, maybe this is just, you know, this is just the one. So I went online and, and looked to see what else they were putting out. And I saw this image of Andy Roddick. Um, and, you know, it says, I am what I am. And, you know, he is basically, what, a champion. You know, he's a little modest about it. That's the white man's burden. But, you know, that's just who he is. And then we, then we have Lucy Liu, who is, you know, basically this innocent, cute little girl. And then we have uh, Yao Ming, who's a monkey on a basketball. <laughs> and then we have uh, Alan Iverson, who's the devil. And then there's Jay-Z, and it says, you know, uh, I got my MBA from Marcy Project. So basically, you know, at the end of the day, he's still just a drug dealer. And I found these fascinating to be like the first six that they released, and they did release others later. But you know, in a country where African American men are five percent of the population, they're represented three times in this ad. You know, and one of them's a, a, a criminal. One white male is a champion. The Asian American woman is kind of deduced to this kind of essentialized, kind of innocent, uh, naive person. And then the, the the Chinese giant is something we clearly don't know what to do with. Um, and then the other black guy is the devil. And the other one is a drug dealer. And I'm like, what is this kind of, I really think about advertising as a form of brainwashing because we see things uh, in repetition, we automatically assume they must be true. Um, and so I started to look at advertising in a much more critical way because although I was making images that looked like ads, I, wanted to, I thought maybe truth is better than fiction. And someone had given me this ad uh, four years earlier in 2001. And they were like, you should do something with this. What do do with this? It was, it was an ad for a 2001 Toyota RAV4, you know, and I just like, I really have no idea what to do with this. And after really thinking about it for a long time, the only thing I could think to do with it was this. And <laughs> by removing the logo, I realized, you know, the last thing you would think this was an ad for is Japanese cars. And so I, I wanted to look at other ads and, 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 and kind of think about that. So I actually just started removing the logos from ads and started realizing that you know, without the cultural context, if we just looked at it as it was, you know, we, you know, we had no idea, you know, it's really about, I was reading Roland Barth, I think about how myth kind of is naturalized through kind of our associations with certain images and products. Um, but advertising is never really about the product, it's about what myths and general relations we can attach to it through very much the, the copy um, and the images. So um, this is an ad I found from 1969. What do you guys think this is an ad for? What? Guys are whispering. 
Shoes. Pants. You are correct. It said uh, slack power, the anti-establishment, post-grad slack by his. Um, and I found it fascinating because the majority of people were making ads today, but especially then, were white men. And really interested in how white males' perceptions of black male identities and values were projected in these images. And as early as 1969, they were appropriating the language of uh, the, the civil rights movement, the black power movement to sell what look like golf pants to like <laughs> the educated revolutionary. Um, you know, so our post, our post grad slacks have soul and a mighty medley of plaid, stripes, and checks. <laughs> um, and so, so, and so basically I started this project, it's called Unbranded Reflections in Black by Corporate America from 1968 to 2008. And in this series, I, I took, removed all the advertising information from uh, two ads for every year from 1968 to 2008, so 82 ads, and just wanted to look at what's really being sold. And so this is an ad from 1978. Does everyone know who this is in the image? It's Joe Frazier, heavyweight boxing champion. Uh, and really was fascinating with how, um, what do you guys think this is an ad for? Margarine. Yes, you are good. It's actually an ad for margarine. Uh, blue, and he says, you know, you think you can get me to eat my flapjacks without my blue bonnet? Try it. Um, but when I was looking at it, you know, the first thing, I, 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 after I removed the text, I thought, really, this is very much a reference to the character of the slave mammy and Jemima. And think about the way that putting the heavyweight boxing champion in the world in any kind of relationship to that kind of uh, enslaved, dehumanized figure was questionable, to say the least. And I think that advertisements are really fascinating because they're not, no one is held responsible, no one is responsible for an ad, you know. We as a society are responsible because they're very much reflections of our hopes and dreams from a given moment. Um, and this is an ad from 2005 that I found in Ebony Magazine. Um, what do you guys think this is an ad for? You're really good for it, come on. <laughs> All right, this was an ad for Kitty Litter. And you might ask yourself, how might this ad for <laughs> why is this ad for kitty litter? How might this ad for kitty litter find itself in every magazine? You know, and I imagine the people in the boardroom, kind of like with the with the um, the Toyota Rav One ad. You know, like how do we get black people to buy our kitty litter? Well, black people like watermelon. <laughs> and what if uh, what would make watermelon more civilized? But if all the seeds were in one place, you could just scoop them away, just like our kitty litter. You know, that, like, that's really the only logic that kind of makes this ad make sense in the context that it was, it was put. Um, and, you know, and so I really find so many interesting things about kind of how we make decisions and also thinking about ads as signs of the time. This is an ad from 1977 that literally couldn't have existed in 1967. Where you have a black man and a white man sitting at the counter eating together. Uh, but the white man's also looking longingly at the black man's dark meat. You know, because you know, after like you know the, the the black exploitation you know era and all these things, where like this idea of the super macho black male has become uh, affected kind of mainstream ideas of kind of what embodies black male identity. Um, and the fact that ten years earlier it literally could not have existed was fascinating to me. Um, but also images that, like this, are, which are somewhat more benign, like a cigarette image, where I, it said it said on the text where the refreshes. But I love this, the, the, the messaging. Basically, the best way to smoke a cigarette, in case you didn't know, was in front of a fan so the air, the, the smoke could just go up and just blow right back into your face. That's how you get that cool, refreshing feeling. Um, but then there were other ads, like this one from 1979, which I found fascinating because I, I, this is, you know, black people moving more and more into the mainstream society at that time. And, you know, I see these people just happen to be black. But where race isn't a factor, I think you see gender roles fall in play. So the men play as the women watch. And there's really something really interesting happening on the left side where you have this woman feeding the, this guy this burger. But if you look at his right hand, he's got his own burger down there. <laughs> so you can almost imagine the photographer being like, oh, you need something to do, feed him. You know? uh, so there's, there's all these other things that I find so curious. And I think that I often believe that you can learn more about a culture by looking at its ads than by reading whole books because it says so much that you can't get a context for. Um, and and um, this was one, I had two rules when I made this project for appropriating, which one was I couldn't use any images that I wish I took, and the other was 
I, if I were to sell them, I had to, to, to um, I couldn't sell any images that I knew the name of the photographer. Um, but this one is one of the images I looked at it and it's like, wow, this is, it was for Black History Month. Um, this is an ad for Chevy, of course, the heartbeat of America. Um, and I was like, it, but it's Black History Month, you gotta understand. Um, and they were like, you know, uh, once upon a time in America, there were people who were proud, they were strong, and it kind of, you know, and it went down this narrative. And I was looking at it, like, wow, this is a really nice image. I kind of wish I took this, I probably can't use it. Um, and then I was like, you know, we, we have the African chief, Rio, and then we have like the civil, uh, the, the, the uh, civil war soldier, and then we have the jazz musician, and the civil rights activist, and the college graduate. Like, this is really nice. Then I was looking at it, I was like, wait a minute. Somebody's missing in this timeline of black history, you know? Because you actually couldn't sell the heartbeat of America with a picture of a beat up bloody slave in the middle of it. Because sort of in the corporate kind of imagination of black history, we came here just like everybody else. You know, we came from our rich roots and we, you know, we fought and worked hard and we graduated, you know? And so like, I, I actually renamed this once upon a time in America, there were no slaves. Um, it is so ironic that during Black History Month, like the major element of black history is like, oh, we'll, we'll skip over that. Um, and so this is the way the whole like, exhibit was installed at the Rubell Family Collection when I first installed it all. But while I was making that work, I actually came across a number of other images that I found fascinating. I like this image on the right, which was an Altoids ad. And I thought that's interesting that now that it's not politically correct to show African Americans, in a certain way, there's a whole host of other brown people that you can show basically in the same way and nobody's going to be offended. And so I started looking at kind of coon images from the, the 30s and 40s and juxtaposing them with uh, these contemporary images and they call them, and this one's called, now that's funny, you know, because it's really interesting how, like, there's just subtle shifts in, in, in what's acceptable. And this one I found so amazing because they're almost identical images taken 70 years apart, you know, where, you, you know, there's this idea that, you know, there's someone halfway across the world, you know, in the hot sun with a basket strapped to their head, you know, who's happy to be doing, you know, your, um, and I mean, I could talk about this so much, but it's so fascinating just to see how we kind of are basically repackaging these same generalization stereotypes in slightly different shades. And I was able to show them to the public um, in, in, in uh, actually in Toronto. Um, and yeah, there was fascinating, it was like that there wasn't much you know, critical feedback because we're so used to hearing and seeing these images. Um, and then I, I wanted to like kind of talk about a whole different project, this project that's called Question Bridge Black Males. It's a, a, a very big departure from that work. Um, it's a collaborative project that I've been doing um, with a, a few other artists and it's really a campaign to represent and redefine black male identity. And it takes part in various ways. There's an installation, there's a website, a curriculum, community events, but I really want to show you just a trailer from the, um, the footage and you can tell us a little bit about the project. Black man, do you want to get out of the situation that you're in? What is the reluctance for taking responsibility for improving our communities? Are your children better or worse off? result of your fault. Why wouldn't you be happy with this? I mean, gay? Why are you so violent? Why do you have that take mentality? Why are you afraid of being intelligent? Why? 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 What I want to know is, why? <clears throat> I believe that we've incorporated a lot of things that are unhealthy to us. We are supposed to be tough. I can't let them see no type of sucker along with various other stereotypes. The level of mentorship in our community is not as strong as it possibly could be. When I came up, well, crack was a quick way for a black man to make a million dollars. Sometimes I think because we think we're black, we, we're some other kind of human beings, but we're just like even most other human beings. Why didn't y'all leave us the blueprint? We did leave you a blueprint. We just didn't tell you where it was. That's something that we dropped the ball on. What do you fear? That something will harm my children. I fear success. Am I the only one who has problem eating chicken, watermelon, and bananas in front of white people? <laughs> <laughs> that word, we have to stop using it. 
I think black people can say nigga anytime they want. How dare you? What, what right do you have to use this word? A lot of nigga questions for the rap. What is common to all of us that we can say makes us who we are? Hmm. This is the easiest question in the world to answer. The thing that we have in common is that we are male and we are black. Right, my question is, I try to live good, but I'm surrounded by bad. And I want to know what it is I could do to do better and live peaceful, surrounded by all evil. How can, how can I do that? So essentially the premise of the project is that uh, there's as much diversity within any demographic as there is outside of it, but how do you prove that? So what me and my collaborators did is we went around the country and asked over 160 African-American men to ask questions of other African-American men. And then we went and found people to answer those questions. And we wound up having an ex uh, about 2,000 question and answer exchanges that really kind of do this amazing thing of like having kind of, there's so many kind of um, projects and social, sociological projects that try to like get to the source of a, a group. But this is a project where actually the researchers and the experts are the members of the group. And, and it's so fascinating to see kind of that um, it's not really about black people or black men in general, it's actually just about people and what happens when people are put into groups and how they relate to one another and themselves. Um, and so we made this fire channel video installation and it's like this stream of consciousness, three hour uh, conversation, which we uh, debuted at the Sundance Film Festival, the Oakland, Air, Oakland Museum, the Brooklyn Museum, um, in Utah Mocha, and also at Chastain Art Center in Atlanta. And really fascinating to, to see so many different people interact with it. We also had an iPad app at the time, but what was fascinating, and when you make video art, you really don't expect anybody to watch it for more than five minutes. But we would have these days where hundreds of people would sit and watch the whole three hours because they, it's really this amazing experience of actually seeing people speak so honestly because you know when you're put in a room with someone you can't really necessarily have a, a genuine conversation but we as the artists were just the facilitators of this conversation that's mediated through video so we have these really you know intense question and answer exchanges that were really revealing about um, people and identity and so recently we've actually we're trying to figure out how to develop a website um, and where we can build other people can it's user generated website where other people can create their own question bridges about any form of identity they want that hopefully isn't just race, gender specific. Um, and but speaking to this idea of identity, especially African American male identity, I refer back to this image by uh, uh, Ernest Withers that was taken at the Memphis San Sanitation Purpose March in uh, 1968, uh, which was the march where Martin Luther King was assassinated and going down this in support of. Um, and I found this image fascinating because it was just eight years before I was born and it was necessary in this country for people to stand collectively and affirm their humanity. You know, um, and, cause the, the, and with the statement, I am a man, because the statement I grew up with was, I am the man. You know, and I found it really interesting how there's just kind of been this kind of change from like during the civil rights movement of this collective statement about we, or the, the collective I to this, um, this statement through the hip hop generation of the, the me. Um, and so I, I actually made a series of paintings where I actually remixed um, this text, you know, starting with actually the Constitution, where you know, African Americans were uh, considered three fifths of a human being when the Constitution was written. Um, and then thinking about other things like, am I not a man and a brother? Um, and this, I am a man, but then I just kind of riffed off of that. But I really read the last um, line as a poem where it says, I'm the man, who's the man? You the man, what a man? I am man, I am human, I am many, I am, am I, I am, I am, I am a man. Because I realized that perhaps, uh, rather than validating ourselves with anyone else's standard of, of what's good and worthy, that maybe the greatest gift that any of us are given is our consciousness. You know, the fact that we can say, I am, is all that we need. And when we look um, in, 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 in sports, like the Paralympics, when we look in science, like with Stephen Hawking, and there are so many different stories where people overcome what we imagine are insurmountable changes to become not just extraordinary, but normal. And normal is extraordinary in, in, in each of us. Um, and so I'm really trying to um, kind of promote that. And with uh, my collaborative projects, 
we've uh, done a lot of work that we feel like, um, which I love collaborating because it forces me out of my comfort zone to do things that I don't want to do. One of my good friends told me, Hank, I really love your work, but it really kind of bums me out. <laughs> so I, I started having to try to figure out how to make work that I thought was good, but also kind of uplifting and interesting. And so one of them was this piece along the way in this project that we had toured around Ireland last year called The Truth Booth, which is kind of like a modern day confession booth. And I'm going to show you just a few minutes of along the way. I don't know. Um, and then if there's a moment in time, I can show you a portion of the truth booth. Um, and along the way, basically, it was um, the first project that we showed at Sundance, but it was also, it's also been up at the uh, Oakland Museum since 2007. And we, were, we applied to try to make this project for this media wall that's a little bit bigger than this. And we were told to try to make a piece that you can enter at any, and exit at any point that was visual stim, visually stimulating. And me and my friend were sitting around trying to figure out how could we do that. And we wanted to try to actually make a video mosaic, because none of us at the time had seen a video mosaic and actually didn't even know how. Um, and so we actually applied with this random idea and then had to figure out how to do it. Um, and the mosaic is really beautiful because you realize that um, it gives you a chance to talk about community in a much different way and the movement mosaic and thinking about how uh, we talk about diversity but we talk but really how um, all these people whose lives intersect on a daily basis who are part of the community who don't necessarily recognize each other exist and I think it's inherently political to actually look at them as, as a collective community where we don't talk about community as this kind of community or that kind of community but we are all a part of the community and these video portraits where we just walk up, we walked up to 2,000 strangers and asked them to just stare at the camera for 30 seconds. Um, and I think that everyone's beautiful if you just give yourself a chance to look at them. Um, and there's just kind of so many wonderful moments in this piece. Um, you know, And like we shot this with point, you know, point shoot cameras on movie mode, and got a DVD that taught learners that taught us how to use After Effects. And none of us had ever even seen. You didn't even know you could put this many videos in a project. You know? um, and there's like just really kind of fun to try to figure out how to make art collectively, where by committee, which is that you can't make art, but I I make it my mission to uh, test that. Um, and because what I can do, which I shot these two things, but this is just, this is my friend, Jorge shot this one, and Baeze shot this one, our collaborator Jessica saw this interesting, amazing kind of thing where this clown is sitting there looking forward, this kid is clowning around, and you know, this generational difference, you know, it's like really that other side of life that we don't really appreciate because we're so inundated with the narrative and also celebrity. Um, and it, it, this new mosaic world kind of allows us to travel differently. This is a couple I asked him to make love to the camera. <laughs> so it, it, it goes on, and you can look at these videos on uh, causecollective.com. Um, but um, I really want to show you guys, the last thing I think I want to show you is just a few images from the truth booth thing, which, so my, I mean a few, moments of the truth. But so basically, Ryan and I and another guy named Jim Ricks, we really like Question Bridge. I'm really interested in kind of creating projects like also along the way where putting the public in the art, getting everyday people to become a part of the collaborative process of making work. And, you know, and I believe, I learned through Question Bridge that everyone has something to offer. And so this, and everyone has their own version of the truth. So we literally traveled the country uh, of Ireland and we went to, this year we went to uh, Virginia. Um, with the truth booth. And I really just want to show you guys, um, probably don't have to skip around, but just a few moments of like what happens when you create uh, opportunity for people to just show um, what they know. <clears throat> um, that's one of my favorites, but I'm going to skip to uh, this dude. There's, there's the whole truth. Bottom chase. 
and top says, thank you. The truth is not to be discovered because it was there before we were born. It hid itself when we were born and it only comes out again once we are dead. I'm nearly dead. So, so there's like all of these kind of different interesting things that happen. Um, so, and then I'm just going to play these last three. Um. Truth. The truth is subjective. There is no truth. She did that four times. <laughs> the truth is, I met a new girl today, and um, he said, he said uh, to take to t tell the camera to, uh, that my dad looks his nose, but she does, and that's the truth. Anything else to tell about the truth? Uh, I locked my dad in the, uh, uh, shed, and, uh, he was suffocating. <laughs> and I didn't tell anyone. <laughs> The only truth is love. That's the only truth. I just got married to the man of my dreams, and I'm in love. The truth is, 
unspeakable pain after 25 years of love and devotion and vows. The truth is, in this world, there are very few people who love you. A lot of people who tell you they love you only love themselves and other people. The truth is, you should be told how to rely on yourself. The truth is, people should tell you not to let anybody else in. The truth is, your family should tell you not to let anybody else in, even your family. Because sooner or later you're going to be betrayed. That's the truth as far as I know it now. This would not have been the truth as I knew it two weeks ago. When I thought I would help because the phone was downloaded and I'd bring it upstairs because he always wanted to phone by the bed whether he was in a different room because he slept better or not. And I saw the message and I texted and she texted back and that is their truth and it was their truth for a very long time. And I asked him, and he denied the truth. But eventually... The so. truth is, it's all about being happy and <laughs> making sure that everything you do is aimed at keeping you happy. So, as you can see, there's just so many different uh, ways that people interact with that and like I kind of just want to leave you guys <laughs> with that. I didn't mean to leave it on the heavy one. I had to show it. <laughs> you know, I looked at that song and I was like, oh. sue me, but they know if they sue an artist, they're probably going to make them rich and famous. So there's never been an issue. And actually what's interesting about the, the, the work that was at Berkia Berbuena with the, the priceless pieces that there was this question of like, you know, are we going to have to take it out if we get a cease and desist order? And after it being up for six months, you know, someone at the museum, it, it, it hit them, they're like, of course we didn't get sued. How else was MasterCard going to get their logo on the front of a major downtown museum? So even in my criticism, I'm actually kind of working for the man. Yeah. Um, anyone else? Go ahead. Uh, is there anywhere we could watch more of these Truth Booth videos? Um, yeah, you can watch this. Uh, the sound sucks. Um, we haven't changed it. But if you go to, there's actually a couple different, our project is called, I think it's the truthbooth.net. Um, but there are other Truth Booth projects. One of them is an uh, anti-abortion website. That's not ours. Um, so, um, but yeah, it's just, we hope, we have like over a thousand of these, you know, and even including the now president of Ireland, you know, it's going to be interesting, we're going to have it at, at the uh, uh, presidential debate at Hofstra um, on October 16th, it'll be interesting to see what happens there. Two questions. One, I'm interested in uh, what kind of work are you working on in the France, and the second is uh, some artists living or... Um, I, 
First, I guess I really see myself as inspired by everything and everyone. You know, I think, you know, life has so much to offer and if you're looking, you will find inspiration. Um, so, I mean, I really hesitate to say which artist because I'm, people who had personal influence on me as a professor of mine, um, and Nicholas is you know, uh, uh, Larry Sultan, you know, but obviously heavily influenced by my mother. But um, really, the fact that you can call anything art, <laughs> that's my inspiration. Um, and in France, I actually wound up um, spending a lot more time just learning, you know, more about how, uh, you know, race and identity are seen differently in France because they, they don't believe in race, but they just have these weird racial kind of segregated populations. <laughs> um, but um, so, so that's one of the things I really spent a lot of time doing. But we were also working on Question Bridge while I was there. I, I have a show coming up at Jack Shaman Gallery next month and spent the whole summer making entirely new work, which uh, the show's in a month and literally there's, that's the only thing that I have that I think I showed you. <laughs> so it'll be, that's finished I should say. So it'll be really interesting to see kind of how the world responds to this work that I, um, is, is so new. Um, anyone else? Go ahead. If you went in the truth booth, what would you say? <laughs> it depends on the great thing about the truth booth is that it's anonymous, you know. Uh, but I think I just say the truth is I love everyone. Um, but you know, the fact that it is anonymous gives a, a, an agency that people can say, you know, different things. And I, yeah. But being one of the artists is different because you're gonna, you know, your teammates are gonna see it. And they're like, don't want to be too much. <laughs> okay, anyone else? Go ahead. Oh, cool. One of, one of the classes they teach is contemporary Ireland. Oh, great. Yeah, it was really great to be there. So that didn't help us in touch. <laughs> <laughs> For the Question Bridge project, I just, it just looked like such a engaging installation. And so how does that part work? You collect all the video, but then how do you figure out how it exists in space and how the videos relate to each other? Yeah, that was hard. Yeah. I mean, literally, like, we proposed these projects and then we were like, okay, somebody's got to figure out how to do it. And then we go through this, like, really arduous, painful, frustrating process of trying to figure it out. Um, and really, so there's no software that allows you to edit a project on five different um, screens. So you have to really kind of do it in this really weird way. But really, you know, there's, for every question, we originally thought we were going to have, like, one question and use the best answer and then another question use we wound up actually having five or six different answers to every question. And that's what created the need for having five channels because we wanted to, to show that there isn't just one answer or one truth to a given question and giving people an opportunity to speak. And again, some of them are celebrities, but most of them are everyday unknown people, but they have so many brilliant and generous things to offer. And um, on the website right now, which is still in progress, you can see some of the uh, question and answer exchanges, but um, the installation, um, I'd love to bring it here. But um, I don't know where else it, it's going to be. I think it's going to be in Houston next. Um, go ahead. Did they find who killed your cousin? Yeah, so the guys who killed my cousin, unfortunately, went back to the same club two months later um, and were robbing someone else for their chain. And while they were robbing him, they were stomping him and shooting into the crowd and they killed someone else. Uh, but that time, um, the police were there and um, Cap and caught them, but they were, and they were like four guys that night, and two of them, like one was 16, one was 19, and one was 20, and maybe 21. And you know they've now they spent the rest, they're spending the rest of their lives in jail um, for a, a petty commodity. You know, and I, I really, you know, struggled with that. And one of them was put on death row and since and was since commuted because he was so young. Um, and I think there was a sense of relief around that because I'm not sure what. And an eye for an eye does in that kind of situation. Go ahead. You two of them, I guess that's it. Uh, Hank, you can, you can present as long as you want. There's not a time limit. Oh, uh, well, people have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, so you have a question? Yeah, I mean, um, in the 90s, there was a controversial exhibit in the book about uh, what they called post-blackness, and then Touré's book on who's afraid of post-blackness came out, um, I guess, last year. 
And I was wondering if you followed that debate at all or had anything to, to say about it? Um, I think um, the, the conversation or the discourse around post-blackness is fascinating because, I mean, it assumes that there actually ever was a blackness. You know, and I think my, I was listening, I was somewhere, uh, there's a poet, Saul Williams, and he was talking recently about how, you know, reality is based upon an agreement. You know, we agree that this is the truth, and if we agree that this is the truth, then it is real. And we always have the choice to disagree with that as the truth and make a new reality. Um, and I think that's kind of how I come to understand uh, race, you know, that like, especially as I have gone to, you know, to, I was just in Germany and Belgium last week, you know, and there are people of African descent there, but like recognizing all the things that I don't know about my quote unquote black culture. Um, and so this, this post-blackness is really, I think, an attempt to really say that their blackness can't be defined through a unilateral monolithic perspective, and I think that's true. I think, but my work primarily focuses on um, the African American black experience, and so in that sense, I wouldn't say I'm a post-black artist in that way. But when I, you know, do, uh, do other projects, including Question Bridge, I do think they have elements of a post-black mentality and thinking, and along the way, etc. Um, anyone? In you? Someone in pink? Is that you? Did I answer? I can't remember someone over there. Go ahead. No, not pink, but, uh, but with Question Bridge, it looked like you had a really rough, uh, wide range of people who you talked to. Um, and it looked like you talked to several people who were in some sort of prison. Uh, what was that experience like? It was pretty amazing, to put it simply. Like, um, you know, we had one question where, wait, who wants to go? Anybody want to go? Nobody wants to go. <laughs> um, um, there's, there's two exchange. We had one question. This was like really a hide and go seek type of project where someone would ask a question and we have to go find somebody to answer it. So when someone asked a question. Um, let me see if I have it because it, it's much better for you to see it that way than for me to show it. Um, it's really impactful. I don't have it, unfortunately. But someone asked a question: What's so cool about selling crack? And there's only one place to go to actually find somebody who's going to give you an authentic answer about that. And so my collaborator, Chris Johnson, started teaching meditation in San Francisco County Jail so he could get access and got us in there. Uh, but this is an exchange that's actually not in the piece that I found fascinating. It's just one, a one-to-one. -one. Um, this is a question we got in, in Birmingham. Actually, right when I was, I gave a talk at the Birmingham Museum right after that. And we started shooting this project down there. You know, I want them. Black man, are you really ready for freedom? And if not, what would it take for you to want and need this freedom? Then we went to this San Francisco County Jail. We showed this guy that question on the screen, and this is his answer three seconds later. Am I ready for freedom? And what would it take for me to want that freedom? First, I would have to stop and ask myself, and I have to, that's, I mean, that's, that's a tough question. Because freedom to me is a mind state, you know, because you got some people that's not in jail that's not free. You know, you got people that's in prison in dysfunctional relationships. You got people that's in prison with jobs, they work nine to five that they don't like. Some people are in prison with alcohol and drug abuse. So I would have to, um, I would have to really ask myself, what's in prison in me? And what's been imprisoning me is my self-esteem, my lack of self-esteem. My lack of self-esteem has led me to commit crime, to hurt people, to manipulate people, right? Because if I love myself, there's no way I could walk around, walk outside this room and punch somebody if I'm esteemed within myself. So to be free to me would have to be, I would have to change, you know? So in order for me to grow, I have to change because if change is necessary for growth, in order for me to grow, I would have to adapt to I would have to adapt the mentality that something's got to change in me. I would have to change my mind state. I would have to change the way I talk. I would have to change the people I, I interact with. That would be free. I was like, whoa. Yeah. I mean, just like, that was like, and so that's the thing with these questions that people, or answers to these questions, people are just 
carrying within themselves that they can, it, this format allows them to express themselves so authentically and so, so uh, articulately. And because like he's not accountable to that other person, he's not watching that person judge him as he uh, go, gives his response to that. Um, and so like that's, and unfortunately that, that, project, that piece didn't make it in the project just because we had so much other footage, you know. Um, but I'm gonna show this last thing that's a little bit more uplifting. As you saw this question, um, and this is kind of the format of how it looks in the installation. Um, this may seem like a silly question, but I wanna know, am I the only one who has problem eating chicken, watermelon, and bananas in front of white people? <laughs> <laughs> Period. No, I'm gonna be honest with you. Um, I don't even eat watermelon because of the connotations that it has around uh, black people. Um, but I will eat some chicken though. <laughs> <laughs> I never heard of bananas. I never heard of bananas. bananas really. Um, I don't know if you're the only one, but it is not a problem for me to eat whatever I want to eat in front of anybody. You're not the only one, brother, to be honest. Um, every, every time, I still eat chicken. I eat a lot of watermelon, and I love bananas. So I'm always looking over my shoulder, wherever I'm at, seeing who's watching me eat this watermelon, and this piece of chicken, and this banana, always. Um, You're not the only one. No, I know plenty of African Americans who, as a rule, will not eat watermelon in front of white folks. Now, for me, I have difficulty relating to the question only in the sense that I've never ever liked watermelon and I don't eat meat. So <laughs> I find myself in a situation where chicken and watermelon comes to a head. But I do know that there are times where you feel like you are the stereotype because, you know, if they say, hey, do you want to go play some basketball? And of course I love basketball. I played it every single day. But there's a part of me that wants to say, no, I don't want to play any uh, basketball. What makes you think I, I want to play basketball? But in those moments, I think we have to be honest with ourselves and just know that there are some things that are true. Yes, you know, we like chicken. We like watermelon. And there's nothing wrong with that. And it's nothing to be ashamed of. It's not a silly question, brother. My family sells 50,000 pounds of watermelons every week. Across <laughs> South Chicago, Milwaukee, and Gary, Indiana, and have been since 1953. And we're okay with that. <laughs> I'm like fried chicken. In fact, I'm gonna make some tonight. <laughs> um, I, I'm not ashamed, but I do give I do give chicken a second thought sometimes, even when I mention it. But I always pass it off as. So not in a jokey joke way, because I do love chicken. Um, watermelon, I don't eat watermelon so much. So I, I'm not really so much ashamed of it. Um, bananas, I hadn't thought about bananas, because I always think about banana, banana because I'm gay in a sexual way. So <laughs> I'm always self-conscious in front of anybody. Just because of sexuality, but not because of race. I think really the question leads to a deeper question. Why are we so concerned with what they think about us? I'm, you know, that's what the real question is. I don't really care. You know, I know somewhere in there I do care, but in my consciousness and what I'm going to say, I don't really care what they think. You know, uh, I don't need their approval in order for me to go ahead and be me, or in order for me to do my job, you know, or in order for me to be who I'm going to be. I don't need their approval. I don't need their job. None of that. You know, um, I think it's really important that we stop worrying about what they think. And start worrying about what you think about yourself and maybe what the little black kid next door to you thinks about you. Fuck some white person thinking what they think about you in the watermelon or anything else. Your shoes, your jacket, you know, your hat backwards. I don't go with the sagging pants, but you know, whatever. You know, that's because it's your cultural identity or your food or whatever. What they think about is not really important. So, I mean, that, and obviously, so like that's just one. And ironically, again, my favorite answer isn't in there because it was just too long. 
But so you, if you realize, you know, you have all of these different men, and this essentially silly question actually reveals so many different things about kind of how, about, you know, self-realization, the way we, 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 we process being looked at and perceived by others. Um, so on that note, thank you guys. Thank you.